Welcome everyone to the CARFA COVID-19 Health Rounds to another series. Today we are looking at raising the bar and we are going to be taking you through the CARFA guidelines on the management of diabetes in primary care and also looking at COVID-19 and diabetes. And we'll be covering module one of a four part series. And so the first of the series will take place today. And then we have three other webinars to be held on the 19th of November, the 26th of November, and the 3rd of December. So we're looking forward to having you participating all four webinars. Just to let you know that CME credits will be provided for each webinar. And what is required is that you, you will need to um, participate in um, each session. Um, please ensure that when you registered that you get, gave us your full details, including your name and um, your email address. So at this time, I, I would just want to highlight that this is even a more special day um, because this week on November the 14th, the world will commemorate World Diabetes Day. And so this health round is also one of our programs for World Diabetes Day. And so we're looking forward to sharing with you the guidelines and other cutting edge information on diabetes and COVID-19. So the objective of our seminar today is to disseminate the CARFA Caribbean Standards of Care for Diabetes and to provide an update on the clinical management of diabetes and COVID-19. Today, we will hear from Dr. Joel Tulak Singh. But before we will do that, we will have three of our partners who are partnering with us today um, and throughout the entire series um, bring remarks from their organizations. So, we are hosting this event in partnership with the Caribbean College of Family Physicians, um, the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. And this event is supported also by the French agency, Agence Francais Development. So I hope I pronounced that correctly. So we're, without any further ado, um, I'm going to go on to introduce our distinguished um, panel today. Um, so first to bring remarks today will be Professor Marvin Reed, who is the president of the college of family physicians. Professor Marvin Reed is a past director of the Tropical Metaboli Metabolism Research Unit, Caribbean Institute for Health Research, and associate lecturer in, in the Department of Community Medicine and Psychiatry at the University of the West Indies, Mona. His research interest spans the gamut of community medicine, clinical trials, and human metabolism. He has co-authored over 140 peer-reviewed articles and has received the Mona Campus Principles and the UE Vice Chancellor's Award for Research Excellence, as well as other international awards for research publications. Professor Reed practices as a physician in a group practice and is a member of the Family Medicine Specialty Board at the, at the University of the West Indies which advises on postgraduate family medicine training. He is a member of several national, regional, and international professional bodies, such as OneCup, the Medical Association of Jamaica, the American Physiology Society, as well as a member of the Research Advisory Committee of the Caribbean Public Health Agency. He is the current president of Wonka North America and the Caribbean College of Family Physicians. And at this point in time, I'm going to invite him to bring remarks. I will be your moderator for this evening. My name is Dr. Tamu Davidson. I am the head of chronic disease and injuries here at CARFO. Professor Marvin Reed, I'll hand over to you at this time. Thank you, Madam Chair. It is indeed my pleasure to bring greetings on behalf of the Caribbean College of Family Physician on this worthwhile endeavor. The Caribbean College of Family Physicians is really a group in a family physician, doctors who practice in, in primary care, 
Um, and we provide healthcare and health services from what we call from the womb to the tomb. Now, as far as we're concerned, evidence, um, there's been significant advances uh, at the basic science level, and at, certainly in terms of the development of treatments for various conditions that we know of, especially the chronic non-communicable diseases. But the challenge that we face is that the, is really the, the, what we call the heterogeneity or the unequalness in terms of the quality of care that our patients receive. And therefore, one tool that we have that allows us to provide better quality of care, certainly at the population level, is the development of standard of care guidelines. And therefore, this tool is an important part of our toolkit as we move forward to ensure that our patients receive some of the best quality of care. CCFP is pleased to partner with CARFO in terms of developing and the rollout, uh, and in technical terms, the translation of this um, treatment guidelines so that primary care physicians and those of us who are at the first point of care uh, for healthcare delivery across the region will have better tools to ensure that we have better outcomes for our patients. So therefore, it's indeed our pleasure um, and for us, our duty to partner with CARFA to ensure that this does happen. And we look forward to the series of webinars that will detailed uh, in a more formal manner the protocols that um, would ensure better health care for patients with diabetes. So thank you again, and um, we look forward to this afternoon's session. Thank you, Professor Reed. We're certainly delighted to partner with you. So our next um, speaker will be Dr. Kylene Raddick. Um, Dr. Raddick is the head of health of the organization Eastern Caribbean States Health Unit, Dr. Radix, um, and Social Division. Um, the Human and Social Division encompasses health, education, social protection, and procurement of essential medicines and medical supplies for the region. Dr. Radix is a public health physician and a health administration leader in the Caribbean. She completed medical school at St. George's University in Grenada and completed a combined internal medicine and pediatric residency in the United States, followed by an occupational medicine and environmental health fellowship, during which she completed her master's degree in public health. She returned to the Caribbean and has held various positions in clinical medicine, academia, public health, and administration and has consulted for regional and international public health agencies. Her life purpose is to contribute to each person's realization of their full potential by collaborating with strategic partners to champion the use of best practices and technologies to improve and to build sustainable and resilient systems. It, we are delighted to partner with her and her unit and organization on this event as they were very instrumental in the development of this guideline. And so um, this is one of our best and fruitful partnerships that we have uh, our own guideline development. So at this time, I invite Dr. Carleen Raddix to bring her remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Davidson. Um, and thank you for, for that. Um, um, glowing introduction. Um, we, I'm very pleased to bring remarks on behalf of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. Um, the Caribbean Public Health Agency is a key partner for us and especially in the area of health. Um, the OECS Health Unit is relatively young um, in that it has been around since 2017. Um, and in its role, it, it has um, championed the cause of the Ministries of Health within the OECS region um, and uh, implements the Fort de France Declaration on Health, which speaks to 10 commitments for sharing resources in health in the OECS region. 
And within the Four Difference Declaration, prevention uh, and management of non-communicable diseases in primary care is one of the priorities. So it was a pleasure to partner with CARFA in the development of these diabetes guidelines. Uh, this um, update took a, a robust process, including experts who were involved in the previous um, guidelines that had been produced for the region, uh, and updated them with a look, um, looking 360 from the different views, not only looking at the evidence-based protocols, but also looking at healthy lifestyles, guidance for persons living with diabetes and access to treatment, uh, including medicines. Um, certainly at this time um, with COVID-19, we know that persons living with chronic diseases, especially persons living with diabetes, are more vulnerable to the complications um, and to the ill effects of COVID-19 and they've had their services disrupted in the process uh, and are more dependent on um, the guidance that can be given to them from their primary care physicians within the community. And so this is an excellent time, um, of course, with World Diabetes Day just two days away for us to um, emphasize and relook at the care of diabetes in primary care, as well as um, what that means in the era of COVID-19. So um, without further ado, I just want to say that um, we're very pleased to be partnering with CARFA and the Caribbean College of Family Physicians on this endeavor, these webinars. And we know there'll be a fruitful series uh, and, and we look forward to the impact it will have on the lives of, of people living with diabetes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Radix. Uh, and now um, we will go on to our next um, presenter to bring remarks to us today, none other than our own Dr. Joy St. John, um, who is the Executive Director for CARFL. She is dedicated and reliable with a track record of achievements in public health systems management and development and health diplomacy. Her firm but their style has assured her a place in networks of practice across the world. She has been the executive director since July 2019, and she provides leadership and direction to CARFA in executing the functions laid out in the intergovernmental agreement. Along with the CARFA team, Dr. St. John has led the public health response to the COVID-19 pandemic in the CARICOM region. As the Assistant Director General of the WHO from October 2017 to April 2019, she had direct responsibility at WHO for climate and other determinants of health and was the first Barbadian to be Assistant Director General, trendsetter. For former Chief Medical Officer of Health for Barbados, she was the first Barbadian to hold the office for over 12 years at, at a top public health level. Um, she was the public health advisor to the Minister of Health and responsible for the oversight of the management of the health sector and also chairman of the executive board of the WHO um, and was the first Caribbean person to do so from 2012 to 2013. So a lot of firsts. Um, so I'll hand over to our dynamic Executive Director, Dr. Joy St. John, true to the name. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tamu. So, let me establish some protocol. Dr. Tamu Davidson, Head of Chronic Diseases and Injury Department at CARFA, and our moderator. Professor Marvin Reed, President of the Caribbean College of Family Physicians. Dr. Carleen Radix, Head of Health at the OECS Health Unit. Dr. Joel Tiluxing, Consultant Internal Medicine in Endocrinology and Diabetes, CARFA staff participants. Good night to you all. 
as the Caribbean Public Health Agency COVID-19 Health Rounds commemorate World Diabetes Day 2020, I welcome you to what promises to be an exciting webinar series entitled Raising the Bar, CARFA Guidelines on the Management of Diabetes in Primary Care and COVID-19. With the support of the French development agency, L'Agence Française de Développement, under the project Strengthening Strategic Intelligence and Partnership Approaches to Prevent and Control NCDs and Strengthen Regional Health Security in the Caribbean. This is a collaborative effort between our valued partners, the OECS Health Unit, the Caribbean College of Family Physicians, and I thank them for harnessing the collective energy to see this to fruition. I especially want to thank the World Diabetes Foundation for funding the development of the guidelines. Our goal is to strengthen and standardize the management of diabetes in primary care and improve outcomes in care of diabetes in the Caribbean. I do hope that as a result, the CARFA Caribbean standard of care for diabetes can be widely disseminated as well as to provide you with an update on diabetes clinical management and COVID-19 infection. Let us zoom in, pun intended, on the disease burden in the Caribbean due to NCDs while bearing in mind that diabetes is a leading cause of death and disability in the Caribbean region, as well as a contributor to the development of cardiovascular diseases. In 2016, 76.8% of deaths were due to NCDs. Also in 2016, 10.8% of deaths were due to diabetes. The age standardized rate for diabetes was 74.1, with 72.1% of that being, sorry, 72.1 being male, and 76.0 being female. And this is per 100,000 for non-Latin Caribbean. Remaining in 2016, the prevalence of overweight and obesity in adults was 53.2%, 45.2% for males, and, and a disgraceful 60.6% .6 for females. In 2016, the prevalence of obesity in adolescents was 10.8%, 10.7% male and 10.9% female. Going back a little bit, in 2014, the prevalence of fasting raised blood glucose was 11.9%, 9.9% male and 13.7% female. An analysis of the outcomes of illness in this pandemic have revealed that persons with diabetes, even younger ones, are at a high risk of severe forms of illness as well as death due to COVID-19. Researchers have also reported that in those who have COVID-19, it worsens the outcome of new set onset diabetes and makes the metabolic complications of persons with pre-existing diabetes even more severe. It is fair to say that with COVID-19 and diabetes, this is not a match made in heaven. WHO has designated 2020 as the International Year of the Nurse. Nurses play a central role in all aspects of the care of persons with diabetes, including diabetes education. In the public health response to COVID-19, nurses have been on the front line, providing care and support to persons with COVID-19 and persons with diabetes. This year's World Diabetes Day 2020 campaign focuses on promoting the role of nurses in the prevention and management of diabetes under the theme, 
the nurse and diabetes. Cardiovascular diseases like stroke and coronary heart disease are exacerbated by hypertension and diabetes and their complications. Cardiovascular diseases account for most of the mortality and morbidity due to NCDs in the region. Therefore, just by improving the clinical management of persons suffering from diabetes and hypertension, you will be going quite a way to achieving the Sustainable Development Goal 3.4. CARFA's strategic plan also articulates the need for a focus on improving the management of NCDs. Strategic priority three refers to healthy living throughout the life cycle, while intervention priority two commits to supporting the use of the chronic care model for prevention, management, and control by enhancing the management of priority NCDs through the development and implementation of clinical guidelines and monitoring of physician practices and treatment cascades in primary care. In so doing, the cascades of care for diabetes and hypertension calculated using national chronic disease risk factor data highlighted large gaps in the diagnosis, care and treatment for diabetes and hypertension in CARICOM member states. Less than half, 45.9% of persons with diabetes and less than a fifth, 17.5% of persons with hypertension in CARICOM member states are achieving control of their disease. Urgent actions are needed to be taken by countries to improve outcomes of persons with diabetes and hypertension and reduce premature deaths from complications of these diseases, especially cardiovascular diseases. Therefore, this series, which starts today, cited within the CARFA COVID-19 webinars, will focus on some achievements which respond to these global commitments, as well as regional challenges or deficiencies, and regional and CARFA agency goals and targets. These achievements are embodied in the Diabetes Treatment and Care Guidelines. In 2019, as part of the 64th Annual CARFA Health Research Conference, CARFA, in collaboration with the OECS Health Unit, and the Caribbean College of Family Physicians launched an updated version of its guidelines for diabetes management. This newest version of the guidelines has been extensively modified from its previous format and uses an approach which includes five modules. Module one, evidence-based treatment protocols. These target primary care physicians, nurse practitioners, and any other healthcare providers who are directly involved in the medical management of diabetes. This module aims to give updated algorithms on care, incorporating the most recent recommendations in the care of diabetes. Module two will deal with guiding lifestyle changes. Module three, guidance for persons with diabetes and caregiver, caregivers, module four, access to essential med medication, and module five, systems for monitoring. But that last module will not be covered in this current series that starts today. So look out for our notifications when we are about to deliver this webinar. So I encourage all of you present including your relevant counterparts to become intimately acquainted with these guidelines and to utilize this valuable resource to strengthen and standardize the management of diabetes in primary care in order to improve outcomes in care of diabetes regionally. 
I look forward to your enlightening contributions to this webinar series. I thank you. Over to you, Madam Moderator. Thank you, Dr. St. John. Um, at this time, we're going to bring up a poll and we're going to invite participants to respond to a poll um, that we have. There are seven questions. And we're going to give you um, three, well, five minutes in total, but we will start our introduction of our presenter within the next three minutes. Um, so once you, once you start the poll, we're inviting you to take this poll. Um, you need to scroll down to get to the seven questions. So on your screen, you'll see questions one, two, and three. Just scroll down. It's not your A-level or CXC. <laughs> Please respond. Yes. Inviting you, encouraging you to respond. Just as a reminder to everyone that within the Q&A, um, if you have any questions to the presenter, you can place them in the Q&A. All other general questions can be placed in the chat once we get started. I want to know if I'm counted as a host and panelist. Yeah, I yes. cannot. Yes, Dr. I Saint. cannot take this poll then. No, you cannot, <laughs> Dr. St. John. It's very, very sad. Yes, just our attendees. We'll give them a few minutes and then I'll go on to, uh, we have probably a minute more and then I will go on to introduce um, Dr. Tulek Singh, but the poll will come down within five minutes. So by 6.30, the poll should be down. I'm encouraging persons to respond. Thank you. Yes, we're looking forward to hearing your responses. We see we have 123 participants online. So we're looking for 123 responses, encouraging you to respond to the poll. Okay, so at this time, I'm going to introduce um, our next speaker and our main speaker for today um, is Dr. Joel David Tulipsin. He will be doing two presentations today. He will be presenting on the Carter Diabetes Guideline Module 1, and he will then present on diabetes and COVID. Dr. Joel David Tuluxin is a consultant in internal medicine, diabetes, and endocrinology at the San Fernando Teaching Hospital and also practices privately. He is a UA graduate and holds specialist training in the UK. Dr. Tuluxin 
is passionate about diabetes research and is the scientific advisor to the Diabetes Association of Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Tim is a host of both the CNC3's live weekly television public health program, Doctor, ask, sorry, ask the doctor, and IBN's Doctor in the House. He is also the author of the daily columns on the COVID Chronicles, which appear in the Trinidad Guardian. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Tuluxin. Please note that the poll will end, uh, should have ended uh, at this point in time. Thank you. Tuluxin, Dr. Tuluxin, we are so pleased to have you here today. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much for that warm welcome, Madam Chair. Good evening to you and to the rest of the panelists and indeed our viewers and listeners. So we wanted to chat a little bit about some of the guidelines from CAFA on module one. So as we've been hearing from Dr. St. John that it will be an ongoing series. And I want to congratulate and thank CAFA for bringing this very much into the forefront. Um, as we celebrate Diabetes Awareness Month and indeed World Diabetes Day, which will be coming up on Saturday, the 14th of November. It's been a difficult year for most of us um, with the COVID-19 pandemic and CAFA has indeed become very much a household name. So as a result of the excellent work that the, the, the body by the agency continues to do in stemming this pandemic. So the presentation will be twofold and we'll be dealing a bit on this diabetes deluge and the deadly pandemic. Right. So we know that we're not speaking about a mild illness. In fact, diabetes is one of the most frightening scourges in the world with 465 million people with diabetes. So I don't know if you're seeing my screen now. No, unfortunately we're not seeing the screen. Okay, let me see. Click on share screen. Yes, we were seeing the screen initially, but you're not on share screen yet. Great. Yes. Okay, so we're back on track. So we have been saying that this is not a mild illness. From that 465 million people with diabetes, one in two persons would be unaware that they have this illness. It's the leading cause of blindness among working aged persons. The leading cause for end stage kidney disease. A leading cause of non traumatic loss of limbs. And you're two to three times more likely to have a heart attack and stroke if you're a person with diabetes. And we've been speaking about all of the global threats ranging from global warming to the onset of the COVID 19 pandemic, but lurking has been this obesity global epidemic which seems to be driving all these chronic illnesses not just high blood sugars but high blood pressure high cholesterol heart disease strokes and a plethora of the complications associated with increased body weight or obesity 
And module one of the CARFA guidelines actually examines this in terms of that fat around the tummy. This is angry, exploding fat. So it's not just a storage depot. These are active cells. So, and they produce a host of inflammatory substances. That is thought why increased body weight is a potent risk factor for death and some of the complications associated with COVID-19 because of the inflammatory substances that would be produced by various fat cells like the interleukins. What is interesting with this slide is that according to the ethnic um, region and in the West Indies, we, we have a mixture according to ethnicity and sex. And I know that Dr. St. John I, I, I alluded to this, but in terms of waist circumference, we're not only looking at the Western European targets or guidelines, you're high risk in persons of an Indo-Asian origin, if you're 33 inches or more as a man, or 28 inches or more as a woman, and West African origin, 35 in a man and 31 in a woman. And the body mass index, those thresholds as well, the weight but divided by the height in square meters will also be different according to ethnicity. And this is believed to not just drive up our blood sugar, as we said, but a metabolic syndrome. I think the statue of David perhaps reflects this quite appropriately in terms of that central obesity, his blood sugar is rising, the testosterone will be falling, obstructive sleep apnea, and this is after, this is after a visit to North America. As well, so I thought it would be remiss of me if I didn't also include a slide of recent vintage. And the metabolic syndrome looks at different facets. So it's not just about the, the waist circumference. Those fat cells are driving the blood sugar, the pressure, the cholesterol, and so forth. But you also look at the good level of the cholesterol, the HDL. You're also thinking about triglycerides, which is part of the panel that would be recommended for diabetics. And we'll be talking a little bit about that with respect to module one of the CARFA guidelines and the management of um, diabetes in primary care. But some targets, and this slide perhaps summarizes you know, at all levels of care, a question that our patients are always wondering about what should be targets, what should be goals. And of course, we know one size doesn't fit all when it comes to chronic illnesses. And the patient in front of you would be dictating goals and targets to reduce risk. So when we're speaking about blood pressure, and we, we have a few slides later on, levels less than 130 over 80, a blood sugar level for someone who is a diabetic, a person with um, diabetes, a fasting level of 80 to 130, postprandial less than 180, hemoglobin A1C targets of under seven and lipids according to whether or not there is cardiovascular risk and genders. We can see the HDL, which is, which is thought to be one of the ways to look at the metabolic syndrome. If the levels are less than 40 in a man, that's an issue, or less than 50 in a woman. So your target should be more than that. And your triglycerides, a goal would be under 150. So when we're talking about high blood sugar or hyperglycemia, we know that this frightening scourge of so diabetes is, is reflected in hyperglycemia. It's not just about the pancreas. And some of the specialists in North America, headed by Ralph DeFronzo, so looked at as many as eight different pathophysiological abnormalities that may be occurring within a patient. Problems at the intestine, problems at the kidney, increased absorption of sugar. So problems at muscle, at the liver. Perhaps the pancreas is making another one of the hormones called glucagon that will raise blood sugar levels and even the brain. There, there are thought to be as many as 11 changes within a person with so diabetes, a type two diabetic individual, making an e egregious mixture of changes. So it's not just at the level of the pancreas and many of the drugs used to control so diabetes 
are actually targeting some of these organs, and that includes novel agents that we'll mention later. So when we're dealing with someone with type 2 diabetes, the delivery of care is of prime importance, and the way that we approach in a patient-centered manner. We know that the basic facets, facets of the history, we know this in terms of risk factors, the medical history, the social aspects of life and family history as we explore risks for becoming a diabetic. Perhaps we don't deal as much on the psychosocial assessments. So I know that we have a broad range of healthcare professionals and it's time that we, we, we bring that onto the front burner that as many as 30 to 40% of our patients may be anxious, may be depressed. And that has been exacerbated since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. And that is perhaps in time will be recognized as an aspect of the metabolic syndrome. Just as we've been seeing um, levels like a low testosterone, polycystic ovary syndrome, a fatty liver, that haven't yet been part of the diagnostic criteria for the metabolic syndrome, mental health issues in time to come, that is the epidemic of the 21st century. And there, there, there's a lovely acronym as part of the CARFA guidelines five, in which exploring the feelings, the ideas, the function and expectations of the patient in terms of the consultation and encounter with the healthcare worker. And there is a marked emphasis, which I want to congratulate the authors on the psychosocial status, particularly relating to depression and diabetes distress. The physical exam, the general appearance, the body mass index, and walking which are measuring tape now in the clinic to look at the waist circumference as we think about that risk for metabolic syndrome. The skin, the mouth, looking for micro and macrovascular complications of diabetes. Examining the feet at each encounter, referring to the ophthalmologist as part of your multidisciplinary approach in getting to goal. Whether it's the hemoglobin A1C, your blood pressure, lipids, body weight, trying to attain goals. So in the office, some basic routine investigations, blood tests, including hemoglobin A1C, a lipid profile, which may be non-fasting, or creatinine, the hemoglobin, because as we know that the hemoglobin A1C may vary according to some factors like kidney function, hemoglobinopathies, and certain states like anemia. And checking a thyroid function, particularly in the type one, so diabetic. And some of this information would have been gleaned from bodies worldwide. Sending a spot urine sample annually for microscopic amounts of protein. That's a cardiovascular risk marker. So it's not just a marker for kidney damage, but it's a marker for cardiovascular risk microscopic amounts of protein. So the nephrologists would love us to be monitoring this. And just as we check the blood pressure and the finger stick levels, it's a tool for primary care. And then if specialist investigations are thought to be warranted, cardiac, looking at the vessels and the fundi. Lifestyle management remains the cornerstone, the pillars for the management of chronic disease. And I know that will be that will be explored in different modules. So it's just a reminder here about the annual review for persons with diabetes, apart from the weight, height, body mass index, which is looked at at every visit, the blood pressure and waste, you're inquiring about smoking, alcohol, compliance to lifestyle, changes, inquiring about mental health, a quick screen about depression and sexual health. That's often part of the stigma in the West Indies. Persons do not want to discuss it, but it, it's a hidden part of the pandemic too. We spoke about examining the feet and there have been studies in the United States that just a quick glance at the feet at your encounter and encouraging the patient to examine the feet daily 
has been found to reduce the chance of infection, ulceration, and amputations. An annual check for retinopathy, the mouth checking for gum problems, and that of course will be impacting on not just blood sugars, but also could be an independent risk factor for heart disease. We spoke about microalbuminuria at least annually, hemoglobin A1C perhaps every three months until you attain control. Lipids, checking a thyroid function in the type ones biannually, but I might want to say perhaps an annual check of a thyroid stimulating hormone in the type two diabetics and continuing to counsel and referring if necessary in a multidisciplinary manner. So the patient remains at the center. The center of all of the consultations is the patient. The rest of us are just essential tools in the therapeutic wheel in the armamentarium to managing the diabetic state. Whether it's the subspecialist, like the nephrologist, the cardiologist, the endocrinologist, and ophthal, and around the mental health professional, the pharmacist, the primary care doctor who is going to work hand in hand. Notice the primary care doctor remains at the peak, at the pinnacle there, will work hand in hand. This year, the role of the nurse comes onto the forefront in the management of the diabetic patient as one of the, as one of the themes for 2020 is World Diabetes Day. And a certified diabetes educator remains a valuable member of the healthcare team. Just a reminder about some of the graphic images. We have a ward at San Fernando General just dedicated to persons with infected feet, to amputations and ulcerations, whether it's due to neuropathy or, or blockages in the arteries, but PAD, so that triple jeopardy of neuropathy, PAD and infection, that leads to amputations. You can see the Charcot foot. Those are all high risk feet and the value of examining the feet and the encounters. It's just a reminder about some of the different specialists in a multidisciplinary approach. The role of the podiatrist, perhaps at primary care, is something that is sorely lacking in the West Indies, well, certainly at Trinidad and Tobago. And the ophthalmologist is something that we often forget. Most of us would not have, have been trained, perhaps, to be examining the retina. So fundal, fundal images, and we, uh, we, we have some excellent screening programs in parts of the Caribbean. This should be an annual check at primary care, and if necessary, would be followed up by the ophthalmologist at secondary and tertiary institutions. So this, this here showing a fundus with a leash of, of vessels. There is neovascularization, the numerous hemorrhages, the cotton wool spots, a very high risk eye who requires virtually, uh, virtually immediate attention by an ophthalmologist. Just a brief flow chart on who should be screened for diabetes. And we're seeing younger and younger persons now being diagnosed with not just type one, but that type two diabetic driven by the obesity pandemic. Um, so, so although one of the, one of the recommendations would have been to start screening from the age of 40. It's perhaps time to start screening at a young age, whether or not there are symptoms of so diabetes, that darkening in the neck, so the acanthosis nigricans that we see in so many girls with polycystic ovary syndrome, we see in younger men, um, persons who have been sent for routine blood tests and may have changes in the liver enzymes. You do an ultrasound and it reveals a fatty liver that is a, is a risk factor for becoming a diabetic. That's a person who you may want to consider screening. So the flow chart looks at, so on the left, whether or not you have symptoms, there is a risk score and there's so many available now. The Finnish risk score is one of them. And you can just plug that in into your phone. If they're low risk, you want to talk about lifestyle changes and perhaps repeating the screen in an appropriate time. Of course, persons who have symptoms, those osmotic symptoms like thirst, urination, blurred vision, weight loss, the tingling in the fingers and, and toes, 
those are persons who you, you would want to send for an immediate diagnostic test, like a fasting blood sugar or hemoglobin A1C. And of course, the finger stick tests in the office or at primary care would be useful, but they need to be confirmed with a venous sample. And even if you have a normal result, you're thinking about um, lifestyle changes then, the, the role of addressing pre-diabetes is also something that we'd like to emphasize here. Those persons who stand on a threshold of becoming a diabetic, it's a red flag, it's a warning that diabetes is knocking on the door. And there is strong evidence that this may be reversed with intensive lifestyle intervention. In fact, a study actually looked at it um, called uh, Diabetes Prevention Program, the DPP, looking at persons with pre-diabetes and going through a, a regime of intensive lifestyle intervention and finding that there was a reduced chance of becoming a diabetic by as high as 58%. And that even beat out drugs like metformin. So lifestyle changes to reduce that risk of becoming a diabetic in a pre-diabetic person. What about criteria for diagnosis as part of the CARFAS guidelines? And this reflects many of the international bodies. The fasting blood sugar level defined as no food for at least about eight hours and water is usually allowed. A normal level, fasting level of under 100, impaired glucose tolerance or impaired fasting glucose within the pre-diabetic range of 100 to 125 milligrams per deciliter. And you would be a diabetic if you exceed 126. So in the absence of symptoms, it would be recommended that you repeat it. And if you use millimoles per liter into different parts of the Caribbean, those are your ranges there on the screen, 5.6 for normal, 5.6 to 6.9 for pre-diabetic. And in excess of seven would be viewed as a diabetic. Hemoglobin A1C is sometimes fraught with lab errors. And of course, we spoke about some of the confounding factors like hemoglobinopathies in the Caribbean that might impact on these readings. Normal levels under 5.7 and 5.7 to 6.4 for pre-diabetics. And a level over 6.5, certainly somebody at an increased risk or a diabetic person. The formal glucose challenge, the GTT, which still part of the diagnostic criteria, um, normal levels, um, you're thinking about 140 to 199 as being a pre-diabetic, that would be somebody two hours after that glucose load, and then more than 200, another one of the ways that somebody may be diagnosed. And someone with classic osmotic symptoms of hyperglycemia or admitted um, with a hypoglycemic emergency, a level over 200 milligrams per deciliter, just as random plasma glucose would be sufficient for diagnosis. Now there are so many drugs, it's like a knocking on the door. So a lot of persons say perhaps it's damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. There are more than 11 drugs that would be available on the market. And we know that it's very expensive as well too. Um, as we start to deal with newer drugs. So you're looking at factors like safety, tolerability, efficacy, and of course, cost when we're talking about guidelines. Metformin, it's an oldie, but a goodie. Since the 1950s, it remains perhaps a first line drug in an obese type two diabetic, um, and it may help with weight. They, that old classic study called the UK PDS from the 1990s showed that metformin may actually um, benefit the heart. And uh, the sulfonylurea is widely available, but we know that some of the older ones would be a, a factor involved. When we're looking at the clearance, the creatinine clearance with respect to metformin, that would be relevant that in persons, if the clearance falls below 60, and most labs now, apart from as part of the renal function test, will give you a clearance or a GFR, an estimated GFR, but that too is easy to calculate based on the age, body weight, and perhaps ethnicity. And as the level falls below 60 of the GFR, you want to halve the dose of metformin, 
and you're really going into murky waters by the time you fall below 60. And by the time you get below 30 mils per minute, metformin would perhaps be contraindicated at that point. So although the risk for lactic acidosis is perhaps overstated, many persons who have never had a kidney function test often present it to practices um, still using metformin. The sulfonylureas, pyoglitazone, it has lost favor as a result of some of the risks which were, which were mentioned, but it still is an excellent drug, even in a pre-diabetic population, perhaps not so readily available anymore in the market in the Caribbean. The alpha glucosidase inhibitors, the DPP-4 inhibitors, GLP-1 agonists, and SGLT2 inhibitors very much were taking the world of so diabetes by storm. And in the next, so in the next viewing or the update of the CARFA guidelines, the SGLT2 inhibitors will perhaps feature more prominently in persons who have high risks for cardiovascular issues or even kidney issues, um, particularly heart failure, as there has been a plethora of studies internationally, ranging from so the EMPAREG, the CANVAS, the DAPA-HF trials, showing that there is a definite mortality benefit in the SGLT2 inhibitors in those sorts of populations. So watch this space, the GLP-1 receptor agonists, certainly an improvement in mortality in different patients. So those two classes of drugs have generated a great deal of interest in the world of diabetes as reducing mortality, helping the heart, um, particularly in heart failure. And that seems to be across the board there was a, um, a big study called the Credence trial that looked at one of the members of the SGLT2 inhibitors, and that looked particularly at kidney patients and showing a definite benefit in things like doubling of the creatinine and dialysis and even death. So, so the situation is quite fluid, the data is changing, and we're seeing so many persons benefiting from this novel class of agents. In terms of insulin, so these um, guidelines, of course, are freely avail available online. And we know that with really looking at cost in these times post to COVID-19 and the rapid acting, short acting, some of the intermediate and long acting agents and the premixed insulins are perhaps more commonly available. So that's just out of interest. And although we talk about starting insulin and that's a separate so discussion in terms of um, inertia and exploring the patient's fears and expectations. Most persons actually think that insulin is the end of the road. Um, they would have heard from friends or relatives that the use of insulin led promptly to death or complications. Not looking at the fact that perhaps the uncontrolled levels of blood sugars and the very high hemoglobin A1Cs would have accounted for micro and macrovascular problems before and perhaps insulin was started too late. And most of our doctors there would, would, would know that. It just re requires time and perhaps that first dose engaging the family members in the office, that first dose administered in the office to actually see. And we know that we, with the availability of pens, the needles are smaller, the gauges are smaller, and persons may be more readily um, accepting to this novel change in their regime. So it's just one of the recommendations here, but in terms of availability now in the Caribbean, in Trinidad, we no longer have the long-acting insulin analog, glar gene available in the public health sectors. So that's found in the, in the private sector. And many persons have actually had to switch to the intermediate actor to NPH or R or even the mixed insulin. And those, to be absolutely frank, once we're looking at hypoglycemia and weight changes, and once we're monitoring this, and we are realistic in our goals and expectations, does not necessarily mean the hemoglobin A1C would be different. And speaking of that, the targets, as we said, one size doesn't fit all. So somebody who is young, who is fit with a longer life expectancy, and they're and we're thinking about reduction of risk. So reducing the microvascular problems, a tight level of blood sugar, tight glycemic control would be preferred and a level under 6.5% 
the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists still use that as their targets. American Diabetes Association and car food look at 7%, but in persons who are older, frail, with a limited life expectancy, persons who are falling, those who live alone and are having frequent hypoglycemic so um, events that may require a third party assistance or even hospitalization, you don't want to be ultra aggressive in terms of management and a hemoglobin A1C of under 8% is a perfect target. So and we have seen this in real world trials, such as a very classic ACCORD study that was a non-drugs company sponsored trial that looked at older persons and there was an increased risk for death if blood sugar levels were too aggressively managed. As the hemoglobin A1C became closer to 6%, persons actually had an increased risk for arrhythmias and cardiovascular disease. Part of the criterion will also include, and we know that in primary care, that we manage persons who may be a diabetic and then become pregnant, or perhaps even gestational of diabetes. We're often called to manage these individuals in conjunction with the obstetricians. They should be managed at a tertiary institution and some of the different goals in terms of the diagnosis and monitoring. That's just out of interest as part of the guidelines there. And we want to be very tight. Most of these younger women are focused, they're driven. They need to be seen, they're, they're specialists as well. So it's important to not, um, to bear in mind that it's not just a matter of monitoring blood sugars, but there are times at which they may be referred to the ophthalmologist, perhaps the nephrologist doing that spot urine protein if they, if they are a diabetic outside of pregnancy. So those are persons who may be type one or type two before they became pregnant. And of course the goals and targets would be tighter. What about type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes in children and by the adolescents? So there is a strong signal that we are seeing a surge um, as part of the diabetes global epidemic in a younger population. So the type 2 diabetics um, would, would, would have been seen in perhaps our parents and grandparents and now occurring in school-aged children, particularly driven by the um, obesity global epidemic. And we'll be talking about healthy lifestyles in another module, but the role for diet and exercise as part of the fast food culture, which has perhaps pervaded the West Indian society is definitely contributing to this. Coupled with a sedentary lifestyle, this virtual environment is not just part of, of schooling now, but a virtual environment in general, in terms of mobile phones, and availability, the lack of availability of green spaces in some of the inner cities around the Caribbean would all be impacting on the risk for diabetes. So there are socioeconomic, cultural, physical, psychological, and even genetic factors that will be contributing to this surge or explosion in type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes in school-aged children. And remembering as well to that marker, if I could draw reference to those markers of insulin resistance, particularly the acanthosis nigricans, as the children are, are staying in the shower and trying to clean their necks and so unable to do so and changes are the knuckles, the thickening of the skin, that velvety skin with, ve with, with, with skin tags and warts, increasing that milieu um, of insulin resistance. The polycystic ovary syndrome, another facet perhaps of the metabolic syndrome. And when we're talking about the treatment, of course, the value for screening, monitoring. We know that apart from type one and type two, there is maturity onset to diabetes of the young. Those individuals have genetic testing that may be done at a private sector and may require sometimes just lifestyle modifications or perhaps I'm a tablet to control blood sugar. There is a phenomenon that was first described in J-type diabetes, the type one and a half or type three, the Flatbush diabetes, persons prone to episodes of acidosis, to ketosis prone diabetes. And those younger persons were admitted to hospital with um, ostensibly with some diabetic emergencies. They resolve, they're younger, very well and fit persons who resolve, they're sent home 
with, with insulin and apparently get spontaneous resolution of the beta cells. Um, and they may be admitted with, um, with subsequent episodes of the, the ketoacidosis. Those are certain um, patients who are best managed, I think, in a tertiary institution in conjunction, of course, with primary care and the relevant members of the multidisciplinary team. What about the treatment of persons who may be overweight, who require a great deal of sensitivity? Persons, persons are, as we spoke about, genetic, socioeconomic, so cultural, physical, psychological reasons for the obesity pandemic in the Caribbean and indeed worldwide. And you want to calculate a body mass index at every visit. So um, uh, it's a reminder, and we saw that was reflected in the CARFA guidelines. And the body mass index may vary and your, your goals in terms of intensive lifestyle intervention and behavioral therapy, it's awfully so difficult. And it's, and it's also part of the stigma. A lot of persons are embarrassed to actually talk about their weight, even at the level of the consultation. And it's something to mention in a very gentle manner and non-judgmental or non-confrontational um, way. The body mass index, 27 to 29.9, some of the pharma, pharmacological um, drugs which, which are available in to different parts of the world, maybe not as readily so in the Caribbean, and it's high time that we started exploring this as useful tools in the armamentarium to deal with, with increased body weight. And if the body mass index excludes, exceeds 30 in persons with diabetes, if you want to consider metabolic surgery, and a host of studies showing that the recidivism or relapse rate is very low. And in fact, in some of the Trinidadian studies and persons with so diabetes who have had bariatric surgery, the reversal rate has been as high as 90% in those individuals who had a body mass index over 40 and they were sent for metabolic surgery. Whether or not it's a magic bullet um, to deal with the diabetes epidemic is a matter of opinion. Certainly the surgeons agree um, that, that it is a tool and most, most um, of the doctors, particularly in those with, uh, um, who are looking after patients who have extreme obesity, the body mass index and persons have tried and failed non-invasive forms of treatment, they may want to consider that as the next step to reversing not just diabetes, but the different aspects of the metabolic syndrome. Just a brief reference here, this flow chart deals with some of the diabetic emergencies. We won't deal a long time with it. The diabetic amacidosis, the ketoacidosis, and hyperglycemic hyper is more our state. Just a reminder that at primary care, we must be vigilant, especially in persons who present with osmotic symptoms of so diabetes, vomiting, weakness, mental status changes, they should be admitted to hospital. You're dipping the urine to, for the ketones and of course the finger stick glucose in office. And these require a high index of suspicion because they may require a higher level of care and may decompensate very rapidly. And of course, in terms of the older persons who, who, are, who are admitted with hyperglycemic crises, those individuals may have an underlying infection and may, may, and may have a potential life-threatening illness, such as a heart attack or stroke, that was a trigger for their illness. And this slide summarizes persons who should be referred to hospital, ranging from the younger patients or the pregnant um, diabetic individual, chronic refractory hyperglycemia, who are prone to metabolic changes, recurrent hypos, the diabetic who's pregnant, we spoke about the complications, that, that require admission to hospital and perhaps even at a level of intensive care. And of course, those persons with life-threatening complications, and that may include um, perhaps the eyes, the kidneys. And... We mentioned about the value of doing a spot urine micro, microalbumin check, and that must be a tool, an annual check for diabetics. Um, so sent off in the lab. I know that we have some, some of the office sticks that, that may also be useful. And 
normal levels under 30, microalbuminuria 30 to 300, and clinical albuminuria over 300. And that is a cardiovascular risk marker by itself. And the medications, we know we talk about the renin angiotensin aldosterone blockers, medications we utilize, tight control of blood sugar, blood pressure, and lipids, stopping smoking and weight loss, all geared towards reducing not just the levels of protein, but in general, cardiovascular risk. And speaking about high blood pressure, we said that we're aiming for levels under 130 over 80, and you're targeting that for all individuals. In terms of what drug is best, just as we looked at in terms of so diabetes, it may be according to the patient. So it's a personalized, individualized approach to chronic illness, but the renin angiotensin blockers or RAS blockers, the ACE or the ARBs, may have nephroprotective effects, and that has been seen in some trials. Calcium channel blockers are recommended for the pregnant woman with hypertension. And of course, you want to be monitoring, and the home pressure kits are quite useful in terms of monitoring blood pressures um, outside of the office environment, as we know that there are so many individuals with the so-called white coat hypertension or even masked hypertension that have a normal level of blood pressure when they, when they are at the doctor's office and then are very high when they go home or at work, hopefully not a cough. So I'm just, flowchart is all part of the guidelines. We won't delve too much into that, but lifestyle changes and salt remains a four letter word when it comes to high blood pressure. So salt avoidance, definitely, um, as well as weight loss, exercise and diet towards reducing blood pressures. And that is the single most important preventable cause of premature death in the world. We know the complications range from strokes, heart attacks, heart failure, blockages to the arteries in the legs, bleeding to the eyes, and even kidney disease. Some of the drugs available on the market in the West Indies, and these slides are taken directly from the guidelines. And uh, so I wanted to encourage that you download and keep those very handy at the office or at the hospital environment. And uh, the second part of the presentation explores the relationship with the COVID-19 pandemic and diabetes. And we know that CARFA has taken very much a leadership role in the management of the, the management and testing of the COVID-19 patients in the region. And comorbidities, that term has been used so frequently at the Ministry of Health press briefings throughout the Caribbean. And we've been seeing that the mortality and most of the deaths due to COVID-19 have been in patients who are elderly with chronic medical illnesses. And hypertension, one of the commonest chronic um, medical problems to persons who, who have actually been infected and even dying diabetes, heart issues, and respiratory system illnesses. Chronic, chronic illnesses remain the leading risk factor for death and in COVID-19 globally. So it's a, it was a meta-analysis and this is a global study with 46,000 COVID-19 patients. Diabetes is a risk factor for death in the persons with COVID-19. So, so there is a matter of opinion whether or not it will increase the risk for actually acquiring the virus. So we know that the value of prevention is so important. Social distancing, hygiene, the use of face masks, appropriate ventilation. And if you have these chronic medical illnesses, we talk about the three C's, avoiding the three C's, those closed, crowded, and close contact settings, particularly those high-risk individuals. And this large sample study in China showed that the mortality of patients with diabetes were definitely higher than those who are not. And it's thought that the increased risk of infection in general occurs as a result of reduced levels of immunity, it may be linked particularly to those with poor glucose control. So poor glycemic control, and that happened for many reasons, perhaps missed appointments, persons who were afraid to go to hospital, 
They were told to stay home, misconstrued um, public health messages, and they stayed at home with many of the acute and chronic effects of hyperglycemia. And the life-threatening problems associated with COVID-19 occur as a result of a cascade of cytokine events. So a host of inflammatory substances are produced by these individuals and the perfect milieu or environment of a cytokine storm leads to a cascade of events, multi-organ failure, pneumonia, the need for ventilation and even death. And perhaps it's thought that that association rests with the renin angiotensin aldosterone system as the ACE2 receptor is where the novel virus called SARS-CoV-2 attaches and enters cells. In fact, at the start of the pandemic, perhaps when we started seeing patients in March of this year, it was thought that some of the ACE inhibitors, which actually increased the levels of ACE2 receptors, would increase access of the novel virus into cells and increase the chance for complications and death. But that has not been borne out in studies. So there is no need to necessarily stop these renin angiotensin aldosterone blockers. We spoke about one of the reasons for glucose so fluctuation in persons with COVID-19 and high blood sugars with diabetes would have been that there was fair anxiety and tension um, it has been exacerbated, as we said, 30 to 40% of persons with these chronic illnesses are also anxious or may have mental health problems that may increase blood sugar. Dexamethasone has been found in trials worldwide to decrease mortality in patients with the COVID-19 and that, of course, exacerbates blood sugar levels. So in persons who require high levels of oxygen or may be intubated, Dexamethasone re remains a cheap, readily available, life-saving drug in the armamentarium for COVID-19, but that may of course cause a sharp spike in blood sugar. We spoke about extreme stress in patients and a plethora of inflammatory cytokines that may lead um, to the so-called storm, problems with diet, reduced exercise. So a background of poor glycemic control and somebody who would be diagnosed subsequently with so COVID-19 would increase the risk for complications. And the targets for glucose management may vary that for mild and moderate persons who are younger, you, you want to be very tight in terms of the hemoglobin A1C or in terms of the finger stick blood sugars, but the older persons, you don't want to be as aggressive when we're thinking about those individuals who are very sick in intensive care. And that falls, that, that advice is actually applicable to all patients at the intensive care setting. The elderly, frail individuals prone to hypoglycemia, getting down to very low blood sugars will be more detrimental than if you allow a more relaxed glycemic regime. And that has been seen in trials like one called Nice Sugar, looking at intensive care patients a few years ago. So hypoglycemia should be minimized during the management of the diabetes in COVID-19 care. In those patients with severe infection, you can never go wrong with using insulin. And I think that is perhaps the most important point, the takeaway point in this part of the presentation, that persons who, who are very ill at, at an intensive care setting on ventilators will usually be on insulin anyway, an insulin infusion, but even those whom you think would be at a risk for decompensation, you may want to consider switching to insulin. So if I could mention, we spoke about the role of the SGLT2 inhibitors, particularly in the cardiovascular patients, those with, with a past history of a bypass or a stent, um, individuals with heart failure, showing a definite mortality benefit. But it's not recommended, and we know that one of the very uncommon to complications includes actually the, the ketoacidosis with fairly normal blood sugars. So it's not recommended for those individuals who are ill. So if you're vomiting, diarrhea, you have an acidosis, you don't want to be using drugs like metformin and some of those, those oral agents, including the SGLT2 inhibitors. 
So interesting studies showing that the DPP-4 inhibitors actually um, wouldn't hurt and may actually help persons with uh, so COVID-19, but that's still just borne out in very small trials. And perhaps the takeaway point is in this slide is that for critically ill patients, insulin infusions remain first line. And if you're unsure about how to proceed as part of the sick day rules, persons who are requiring insulin may actually need more. So as a result of high blood sugars and have a very low threshold for recommending admission to such individuals. At, at least in some parts of the Caribbean, we, we, we are actually managing patients who, who have uh, the COVID-19 at home and care of the chronic illnesses remain of paramount importance to not just the patient, but perhaps those around and the consulting medical team. So summarizes there, as we're looking about type one and type two diabetes, there is actually a thought that persons who are admitted to hospital with the COVID-19 may actually be newly diagnosed individuals. So at that point, they may have had pre-existing diabetes or even a new onset to diabetes. So there's a register worldwide. So actually advocating for doctors around the world who are finding patients with so diabetes and COVID-19 to actually consider joining on that register, whether or not the virus is going to cause direct damage to the beta cells in the pancreas. So it's a novel virus. So it's something that we've only encountered this year. And there is so much information that is burgeoning in the medical literature. So mild, moderate and severe, just to remind about use of insulin as first line and milder patients who have very good uh, diabetic control, they're being so managed at home with COVID-19. You may want to continue and want to consult with doctors if an adjusting regime is required. So in closing, it's so important for the diabetic person in this as part of the new normal during the COVID-19 pandemic that there would be remote to consultations, the need for telemedicine and Priorities, though, should include newly so diagnosed individuals, vulnerable persons in high risk scenarios. And of course, the need for face to face appointments for persons with um, diabetic feet. We spoke about the urgent ophthalmology cases, um, high risk pregnancies. So actually training and educating, it may be necessary for diabetic nurses and educators or those at the levels of primary care to meet somebody who's a type one, so diabetic, and starting insulin in, in those settings, emergency settings, and blood tests that are abnormal that require changes in treatment. But it involves social cohesion. The multidisciplinary team remains at the center of not just the CAFA, but all international so diabetes guidelines and self-management. So it's individualized or personalized approaches to care for diabetes, but also within the community. And that includes support for stress. So, um, and of course, the value for physical exercise and access to healthy foods at an affordable cost, particularly those who may be struggling in a socioeconomic battle since the start of COVID-19. And the role for vaccinations when we're dealing with so COVID-19, and we've been saying that the flu shot, the influenza shot as part of the twin pandemic. We're dealing with the start of influenza um, in the Caribbean, North America and Europe. And all persons with chronic illnesses, pregnant patients, healthcare workers, those at extremes of age, six months to five years or over the age of 60 should have an influenza shot. And it's perhaps recommended for those more than six months of age. So the value for the influenza shot, and uh, we know that there is some exciting research this week on a Pfizer vaccine, but of course it's early days yet as we consider the durability of these drugs and the response. So a reminder that World Diabetes Day would be on Saturday in throughout the, the world to Hindus to celebrate the Holy Festival of Lights, the Diwali, which is also a time for feasting, but a time for celebrating the triumph of knowledge over ignorance, light over darkness, and good over evil this Saturday. And a reminder that it marks the birthday of 
Frederick Banting, who was one of the discoverers of insulin in Canada in the 1920s. So we'll be marking 100 years very soon since this life-saving drug became available. And imagine he sold the rights to the University of Toronto for $1 so that it was available to everyone. And I think that a closing quote from him, insulin does not belong to me, it belongs to the world. And we think about the cost of insulin and some of these agents now, and it boggles the mind. And Buddha, I think, in closing, says it so well when we talk about not just health, but also so diabetes. Without health, life is not life. It is only a state of languor and suffering, an image of death. And how often we see it in the persons with poorly controlled chronic disease. So my references. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tulloxin, um, for an excellent, outstanding presentation. I hope you can take a deep breath and, and probably a drink of water at this point in time. And uh, we had one question um, that I saw burning in the chat and that I'd like you to respond to. And it, the question was, can patients beat diabetes naturally? And what a fabulous question it is. And the simple answer is yes. We're speaking about a rule for intensive lifestyle interventions. We discussed one of the trials called the DPP study from a few years ago, and they've actually looked at patients who may have been at risk for becoming a diabetic. They were pre-diabetic and standing on a threshold of becoming so. And they found that intensive lifestyle changes diet as well as exercise, coupled with weight loss, reduced the chance of becoming a diabetic by as high as 58%. And perhaps it's not as easy as it sounds when we're dealing about this complex interplay of genetics and environment when we're dealing about obesity, but certainly for type two diabetics, we all see this in our practice, that it is possible to reverse they're seeing this in trials worldwide, that it does not necessarily mean it's a death sentence. Um, neither would it mean that, I mean, if you're looking at the complications and you're appropriately screening, you may become someone who has um, diabetes, but controlled with just lifestyle changes. There is a reversion and a restoration to normal blood sugars. Persons speak about a return to a simpler lifestyle, fruits, vegetables, nuts, peas and beans, low fat foods, the Mediterranean diet, and uh, the value for, um, for avoiding those high starchy, high fat foods. Um, and a role of exercise, 30 to 60 minutes for most days in a week of some sort of physical activity, all go towards re reducing blood sugars and it will also help with those, those other aspects of the metabolic syndrome. So in a simple term, I would say yes, so if I could go further, I don't think that there is a rule for herbals or medications necessarily. So I know that when we talk about natural agents, um, many, many persons would talk about vitamins or some of the herbs, some of the advice that they get from the neighbor or the chap down the street. And, uh, and it's not that these drugs may not necessarily work, but in a simple way, I can say that, that they, they have not been studied and have not undergone rigorous trials. So in terms of the scientific evidence, it would be lacking in terms of whether or not they would be useful for diabetes. Okay, thank you. And we have four more questions here. And I think one of them you would have answered. So I'm, I'm going to there in the Q&A section, um, you could type a response, but I'll um, raise some of these questions now. But I just like to highlight to our participants that um, this is not actually our first regional guideline and um, CARFO and the region of the um, Caribbean, we have been trendsetters. And even before CARFO, when we had CARIC, our first Caribbean guideline were for primary care um, was printed in, published in 1995. The second guideline was published in 2000 and the third, 2019. 
um, where we just had an outstanding presentation by Dr. Tuluk Singh. So the question here that I have for you is, how can elderly persons at home who are unable to, to go walking increase physical activity to help manage the chronic conditions? Yeah. That's, That's a first question. question. Very insightful it's a question. Right. And I'll give you the second one. Yeah. Is the significant differences between this guideline and others, why would you recommend a carbon phys physician reference this one? I, I may mean, be able to highlight some of these. And then the third question was, are you saying that COVID-19 can bring on diabetes or increase the risk of stimulant development of it? So, and um, those are the questions we have for you today. Thank you. If I could address the first question that with respect to some of the ways that an older person who is trying to stay safe at home and maybe isolated or maybe quarantined at home and trying to control levels of blood sugar may vary. So if you're thinking about your yard or simple things around the home environment, if you're up and down stairs, some persons may have a treadmill or um, a bike, an exercise bike, just simple walking so around the yard or in the home environment or in the community. So if it's thought that it is safe. Um, I know that we've had misconstrued um, ideas about the risk on the outside. It's not that you're going to get a miasma of the virus around if you go outside. So if you take appropriate steps in terms of social so distancing, that it would be relatively safe. And in fact, ventilation is one of the key aspects um, of re reducing the risk for transmission of SARS-CoV-2. So there are subtle ways around the home and trying to get perhaps 30 to 60 minutes, maybe split during the course of the day. So if you can get perhaps um, some of the time in the morning, a little bit in the evening. So it's going to help not just the blood sugar and blood pressure, it will help bones. So it will lower, it will lower the chance for cancer the elderly individual too is at a risk of being socially isolated, anxious and depressed in the midst of the pandemic and they'll help mood it too. So apart from being isolated and trying to connect virtually with the world, just being outside is going to boost the mood, so the endorphins in the brain and lower the chance for mental health issues. So splitting that time and trying to get some fresh air around the community and if that is not possible, if it's not safe or deemed that you have to stay in the confines of your home, different ways around the home environment, just simple walking to keep going. The third question involved whether or not the novel virus increases the chance for worsening glycemic control or perhaps even becoming a new onset, so diabetic is actually both, um, that scientists are wondering that persons who may have had a background of good glycemic control and present to hospital with stress hyperglycemia and so in the throes of an infection and then are discharged subsequently and their blood sugar levels are still elevated that it may represent the fact that the virus is directly affecting the beta cells in the pancreas so it's unclear whether there is a new onset of so diabetes in persons infected with COVID-19 so and as we know that any infection the stress of any infection for different reasons including the inflammatory substances in the body psychological stress, not using medications, a background of poor glycemic control is also going to exacerbate um, when you get to hospital. So as I mentioned to you, if you're in intensive care and you're diagnosed with COVID-19, so inevitably now the standard of care has become dexamethasone along with ventilatory support. So, so it's almost inevitable that you're getting at least six milligrams of dexamethasone for 10 days. That's sometimes one of the regimes used in an intensive care setting. And that will further raise blood sugar levels and do a prune. So if you could repeat a second question, I missed the first part of what you said, so Dr. Davidson. Okay, and this question is with respect to, I think you, co you covered it with COVID-19. Can, can COVID-19 bring a di on diabetes or increase the risk of permanent development of it? That was the third one, right? But that was the third one, but there was a second one. I know there was a first um, so question that we dealt with about exercise right. in the elderly, but was there another one? Diabetes be reversed. Diabetes, right, okay. Okay, we discussed that as well, okay. Right, yes. Sure. 
Um, there's another question here. Um, what level of CKD should primary care physicians stop metformin and ACE inhibitors given the unavailability of blood electrolytes and long clinic appointments to renal clinic in the pandemic? That has certainly been a bugbear for all of us in the medical fraternity that you're missing appointments. And well, apart from just for the basic bloods, you're not even getting back things like the microalbuminuria or the microscopic amounts of, of, of protein of albumin. And most of the persons are actually turning to private doctors in so primary care or at the levels of the health centers as more clinics are starting to reopen. And as part of the telehealth, as part of the tele so conferencing, we should be encouraging our patients to at least have these routine investigations and all that we've learned more about COVID-19. So as the GFR starts falling at a level of under 60, you would want to think about halving the dose of metformin. So if the GFR falls below 60, so that's looking at stage three, CKD. And so if the GFR falls below 30, you probably want to stop it at that point. It would be contraindicated as the level falls below 30 as a result of the theoretical risk for lactic acidosis. We know that metformin has a host of advantages that we enumerated in the guidelines. It's still first line and it could be part of the regime for so many patients as we step up care. Most persons will not just remain on to metformin. You may want to refer those individuals to at that stage to see a nephrologist and Many of the nephrologists would be keen to continue the ACE inhibitors or the angiotensin receptor blockers in those persons, even at stage three or stage four kidney disease. Once the potassium level becomes normal and is no, remains normal, and there is no level of renal artery stenosis or the complications. So in fact, perhaps one of the nephrologists, I remember attending a meeting where he said to consider an ACE inhibitor until death for many of the renal patients because of the positive effects, perhaps on the cardiovascular system. Many of these individuals have heart failure, congestive heart failure, and that is an essential part of the regime to reduce mortality in those individuals. So you may want to have a chat at that point with a nephrologist, the cardiologist, or the internist to decide whether or not it's necessary to stop the, the renin angiotensin aldosterone block. I certainly wouldn't at that point if the potassium is normal but you may want to consider it in persons as the GFR starts falling. The same advice goes to the new class of drugs, those glyphosins, the SGLT2 inhibitors that cause excretion of sugar in the urine, like empagliflozin and canagliflozin, all drugs that are very much exciting parts of the cutting edge um, management of diabetes and the new millennium because of the many advantages associated with them. And, but, some of these drugs would have to be stopped based on the level of GFR. Thank you. Um, I'm going to give you, um, the other question is, um, has there been concerns of metformin use lately? I'm just going to invite our team just to put the poll up in the interim um, so people can respond to the poll while you respond to these questions. So can you put the poll up? Um, so concerns about metformin, um, there's a question if there, its use um, has been a concern of lately. Um, and then we have another question about um, comments on the practice of intermittent fasting and glycemic control in diabetes. You know, that's quite popular now. Um, and diabetes can be in remission with healthy lifestyle for a while. What monitoring is required? So all very insightful questions. And I know that we have had some, some very, very enthusiastic participants as part of this first series of the Diabetes Month Awareness from CARFA. And metformin has been very much in the news because of the fact that there, there have been fears about recalls, particularly with respect to carcinogenic contaminants in some forms of metformin to different parts of the world. I don't think that we have these specific brands around the Caribbean, around the West Indies, but it's, it's certainly a question that our patients would be worried about, especially in the world of social media, 
that we have found, we have found that um, that there would be worries, there would be concerns, but definitely in persons with kidney disease, liver disease, if you get over the GI tolerability issues, metformin, I think those brands within the Caribbean should be safe. Um, to and, and of course, the Food and Drug Administrations in so different territories would be exploring the different brands that we have. And we do have a um, host of generics now available as part of the public health um, initiatives in the health centers and hospitals throughout the region. So intermittent fasting, an excellent tool, I think, in the management for persons who may be obese or diagnosed recently with our diabetes. Some studies are showing an improvement in insulin resistance. And we know that that is a hallmark when it comes to type 2 diabetes, um, when we're talking about some of the pathophysiological changes associated with it. Um, there have been some studies showing, though, that um, at least from a scientific standpoint, the rigors of a scientific trial that um, intermittent fasting will not definitely cause um, an improvement. But we have seen this anecdotally, I think. Most of the persons who tried it, it's important to, to bear in mind that their medications may need adjusting. And persons who embark on um, intermittent um, fasting re regimes must be vigilant about things like um, hypoglycemia. So the, the drugs may need to be amended. So in terms of the doses or even the number of drugs or the frequency of doses based on what you would have them on would need to be amended as you try to attain a hemoglobin A1C under 7%. Um, and, but so it's a useful part of intensive lifestyle intervention, I think. Has not been borne out in big trials yet, but of course, for the absence of evidence does not mean that there is the evidence of absence. So, so as we have seen in some of the some of the treatments and some of the advice that we've given so far for COVID-19. And in persons who would have had reversibility of their diabetes as a result of lifestyle changes, or perhaps would have gone for bariatric surgery, I would still maintain that they would need at least a hemoglobin A1C or glucose checks intermittently, perhaps every six months, um, minimally would be, would be my so recommendation and follow up with your doctor and still seeing the relevant specialists. So let's say that you've had someone who has kidney disease and would have stopped their diabetes drugs for different reasons. Um, they often seem to forget the fact that they are a diabetic and would have had sometimes silence or complications that require following. Okay, thanks. So we have two more questions. I think we'll just take two more questions. One, will, one speaks to COVID-19 has caused reduced physical activity through home confinement, affecting normal adolescents and obese adolescents who were known at a vulnerable stage of development and risk of developing type two di diabetes. Throughout the presentation, you stress a lot, of, lot on corrective lifestyle choice as the ideal method of managing obesity to prevent diabetes. How challenging will it be in getting regional bodies and governments to implement new me measures to ensure adolescent practice good lifestyle choices. Yeah. Thank you very much for your point. It's an excellent one. I think it would be driven as part of the recommendations from CAFA, at least when there is, um, there is an update that that there will be a lot more focus. And I know that some of the other modules actually explore the value and role of lifestyle changes and the management of chronic illnesses, so not just diabetes. Um, if I could also say too, to Dr. De Dr. Um, Davidson and the rest of the panel that we still need, we still need to get to these um, so guidelines and awareness out there. So I remember as an intern, a junior so doctor at the hospital in San Fernando, that we had these books from CAREC at that time with the guidelines for hypertension and diabetes and the management in primary care that were available in the tertiary institutions and the health centers. And the recent update, we haven't been seeing them. That's why I think that one of these polls would have been saying that, um, that, that a lot of persons would not have been aware that there was a recent update in 2019. So I think we need a lot more awareness at all levels of healthcare. And the, 
the role, the role for improved exercise and physical education in schools must be emphasized to, I take your point, at all levels of um, all levels of healthcare and at the government, as we try to legislate at one of the um, one of the symposia in 2007 to actually manage chronic so disease in the Caribbean that was held at Support of Spain as part of a declaration to battle NCDs. Um, that was an integral part to get moving. And the screen time, I think it's one of the problems with technology, the fears of going outside and getting to COVID-19, the fact that many of our children are not in school in places like Trinidad and Tobago and they're actually having virtual or online education. And, and of course, just in general, but this use of cellular phones and technology and a lack of interest in physical activity is definitely something that is a burning topic and we need to encourage safer green spaces, I think, but, but this is something as well to that the governments around the Caribbean would have to address safer areas for persons, especially in um, those regions with lower socioeconomic or depressed crime ridden zones that tend to be particularly ravaged and disproportionately affected by not just um, obesity, diabetes and hypertension, but also COVID-19. So your point is an excellent one that is a lot more at the level of legislation to improve and encourage um, physical activity, not just um, amongst children, but the availability in free spaces, in green, green spaces, parks, beaches, it's time to open them out. Um, there is no rule to have these places closed as they are actually low risk zones for transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Thank you. I just want to add that there is a Caribbean plan um, which addresses childhood obesity at the policy level or six point policy package. In, um, and you will see over the next coming months and over the next year, a lot of push to roll out our school guidelines. There's a lot of work that's been done um, at the country level to really address childhood obesity. And we know more needs to be done and um, so you're going to see a lot from through PARFA or partners such as PAHO or partners such as the Healthy Caribbean Coalition continue to work in this area at the policy level, looking at front of packaging labeling, looking at um, school nutrition guidelines, um, promoting physical activity right throughout um, the life cycle. So there's a lot of work that's being done with our member states and within member states to do this. And so look forward to this, uh, more of this, and seeing more of these activities being more visible in, in the general space. Um, I think we'll have our final question. This question was, um, the question is what aspects are Caribbean specific with respect to the guidelines? Do we expect that a patient managed via these guidelines would achieve better outcomes, for example, why choose to reference this rather than NICE guidelines? Yeah, thank you. And we're speaking about, well, in terms of lifestyle interventions, but those remain the pillars of any illness and that is global. But I think your point is with respect to the availability of resources, sometimes in the third world setting, a resource poor setting, the availability of some of these newer drugs remains a bugbear. And I understand that. Um, I, I think safety, tolerability, so um, efficacy and cost, it's an individualized choice. And that's why when we had that slide up in terms of medications, um, so it, it, it was a nuanced sort of so conversation as to which drug would be best used after metformin. We're talking about the high risk persons, such as those with heart, heart issues, kidney disease may want to consider the SGLT2 inhibitors. The GLP-1 the receptor agonists are not available in many of the territories. And we may have to consider some of the newer sulfonylureas to achieve the glycemic control. So your target levels of hemoglobin A1C would be readily, would be, would be something that you want to focus on initially. Um, so, and the goals would be based on availability of drugs, safety, tolerability, efficacy, and price. The step um, protocol, I think, when it comes to medications. Likewise, if we talk about insulin, so some of the recommendations from NICE um, may re revolve around 
once more availability and cost. And that tends to drive most of these guidelines. So, so in fact, it has been to paraphrase that. So guidelines are the last refuge of the scoundrel. And um, it, they are just meant as traffic lights advice. Some of the practice points based on many studies and trials worldwide. They are not cast in stone, but they are just useful tools to reference. Some of the, some of the tidbits from NICE, American so Diabetes Association, or even IDF may be applicable to settings that you work in. So whether it's at primary care or the hospital, it's variable. The most important thing is to individualize or personalize our care. And remember that the patient remains central to everything. Whether or not we start met metformin and there is GI upset, at that point, the patient will stop the medication. It may be cheap and readily available, and it may be a beautiful drug as a first line for an obese type 2 diabetic but it wouldn't serve a purpose if the patient is nauseated and having diarrhea. You may want to consider then switching to a sulfonylurea. So if the patient is able to afford, perhaps a DPP-4 inhibitor with fewer side effects. So if it's available within the public sector, the SGLV2 inhibitors for those high risk persons may be a next step. And of course, based on availability of insulin, you may want to consider use on the hemoglobin A1C and targets. So you have to individualize and personalize CARFA, as would be the other associations and other diabetic bodies worldwide, just provide recommendations and useful tips and advice, gentle nudges on how to manage your practice. Thank you. Guidelines for guidance, uh, but the patient is the center of that care. Thank you, um, Dr. Tulip Singh. So we have gone a little over time um, to tonight. Thank you for everybody who stayed on. Um, can you please give us just a basic take home message? And um, I'd like to just remind everybody to complete the evaluation form um, that we'll send out. It's very important for us to get your feedback so that we can make this bigger and better. Um, so at this time, I'll invite Dr. Tulip Singh to give um, some brief remarks, um, closing remarks, key message, and then I'll in, um, ask for our um, Dr. St. John just to say one or two more remarks. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. I would just like to say that it has been a privilege and an honor to be a part of this symposium. So, so it's part of the new normal that we're holding all these meetings by Zoom. And so I would like to thank you too, Dr. Davidson, to be instrumental. So I know that one of my mentors, but the professor of endocrinology in the Caribbean, um, one of them locally, Professor Suraj Paul Tilaksing, who was also um, part of the guideline body. He was part of the working group to develop these guidelines in the management of so diabetes, and he was instrumental in extending a very kind invitation to be a part of this esteemed panel. And the watchword for chronic illnesses and for COVID-19, the watchword is prevention. So we're thinking about preventing the micro and macrovascular so complications and also preventing infections with this novel SARS-CoV-2. God bless, good night, and thank you. Thank you, and uh, Dr. St. John? So I just wanted to thank um, Dr. Dr. Tilak Singh for an excellent presentation. I cannot believe how much information he was able to pack into this time. And he made some jokes in between, I love that. But I also want to thank the rest of the panel. And I want to especially thank the organizers, but most of all, I want to thank the participants who were intensely engaged and have kept us going long past when we should have stopped. So, uh, Dr. Davidson, another good job. And I think it's time that we can all turn in for the night. Yes, thank you, Dr. St. John. So I'd like to thank everyone for coming. I just want to remind you 
that we have three more webinars to complete the guideline and we want to ensure that in every member state, everyone knows about this guideline. It's, it was developed for you with you in mind in order to improve the care. So as we say, walk good and take care. Thank you everyone. And thank you for staying on tonight. So the next event, please remember, the 19th of November, we're looking out for you. Thank you for coming today, tonight.